check out her extensive body of work as you leave the library. There's a faculty spotlight display case, and you'll get a full extent of what she has done. But I'm just going to read out a bit that came through from, that just came out in this newsletter, where it says, um, Anna Ohanian is the Richard B. Finnegan Distinguished Professor of Political Science and International Relations, right here. And our town historian says he has connections with Richard Finnegan, so you should check with him. <laughs> um, she also founded the Global Development and Security Studies program right here. She chaired the uh, Political Science and International Studies department here for three years and uh, was a recipient last year of the Michael Horn Award for Distinguished Faculty Scholarship. As you can sense, the word distinguished is very associated with Professor Anna Mokohanya. She has also she's also the non-resident senior scholar at the Carnegie Endow Endowment for International Peace, the Russia and Eurasia. And let's see, a two-time Fulbright scholar. Always dreamt of that, and you've gone and done it twice. So, so um, if you all haven't yet. Five, five, I've written five, five books. Scholarly books, Cambridge, uh, Stanford University Press, The Neighborhood Effect. Here to get us thinking on why certain regions of the world are sort of cohesion, right? Solitary and poor and nasty yeah. and brutish yeah. and short and generally in conflict, and others that should be tearing at each other's throats are mm -hmm. not of resilience. That's such a powerful word, and here to get us thinking about resiliency is Professor Anna Bohanian. It's really very, very kind of you. Such a kind introduction, I'm assuming. I don't need to do an introduction for the camera. You already did um, it. Was that recording? <laughs> so here's a little warning, if anybody's on America's Most Wanted, now is the time. <laughs> um, well, hello everyone. Thank you very much for coming, um, especially the weather being so nice. Uh, but unfortunately, and I'm really excited for this book, big thanks to Uma for putting this together. She got this on our calendar, I think in summer when the world, the regions that I'm studying were very, very different. So um, today is going to be a very difficult book talk for me, I have to be honest. Um, as we speak, let me see, actually I'm just gonna put it this way. This is the region that I'm talking about. And I, the purpose of this book, as well as my prior books, has been largely to understand how it sounds ambitious, it sounds crazy, but as a scholar, it does keep me up at night, <laughs> coming from a conflict region, as to how to prevent conflict, what is it that we're missing, and um, this book is very much an effort in that. And um, today, uh, I'm standing in front of you as a defeated scholar, very much defeated scholar, For the past few years, I've been looking at and analyzing the ongoing conflict in Ukraine, the Russian invasion in Ukraine. Um, but as we speak, and this is a photo of um, a Ukrainian child leaving Ukraine and saying goodbye to his father, her father. Um, but as we speak, and I'm not dramatizing, there is an ethnic cleansing going on in this tiny region. I don't know if I can point it. That tiny region that says Nagorno-Karabakh, that says the Panagert, um, that's where Armenian, it's an Armenian populated, majority Armenian populated administrative unit that was part of uh, Soviet Azerbaijan, but it really predates, uh, Armenians have been uh, living there for thousands of years, and the entity is just populated by over hundreds of uh, churches and monasteries. So as we speak, the, this region essentially is going through an ethnic cleansing because there was a military assault by the Azerbaijani government, Baku, a few days ago, actually on September 19th or 20th. It lasted short, 
over 200 people died, but basically the intent was to bulldoze through a peace process. The United States was heavily engaged in this peace process. Russia was trying to build a, a peace process in parallel. Russian peacekeepers have uh, placed themselves there. I'm not going to give you an, sort of an analysis and history of this conflict, simply to say that there was a peace process, but the Baku government, Azerbaijani, Petrostate, very authoritarian, really attacked the region, uh, validating violence as a strategy, and right now, essentially, people are moving. Uh, there are 120,000 people that were left, and they have been subjected to um, a blockade for the past eight, nine months already, and this was the military culmination. As of now, over 50 or 60,000 people, half of that population has already left their ancestral home. So uh, this is what an ethnic cleansing looks like to me. I'm not going to put a lot of photos. These are children in Nagorno-Karabakh um, that are leaving their names on the wall of a building because they know they're not going to uh, be able to return uh, to their homes. This is the convoy of aid, food, in, in, uh, that was blockaded, that was blocked, and uh, Azerbaijan prohibiting for this aid from Armenia to enter into the entity. So hunger was used um, as a weapon for months on end. Um, and this is the convoy, this is essentially, this is the only road connecting Nagorno-Karabakh, this Armenian population entity to Armenia proper. And this is the people fleeing um, Nagorno-Karabakh, trying to get into Armenia. So. This is the reason as to why I feel defeated, but I'm going to try, I don't know how cancer scholars, cancer doctors do their work honestly, or any doctor does their work, but I'm gonna to try to be objective and kind of zoom out and try to be as methodical as possible. And if I get verbose at times, I do apologize. So the question that I'm trying to understand and what I have been arguing in this book, that the reason that these types of conflicts happen is because number one, we lack regional approaches to, manage, to managing conflicts. Um, but also, um, what I argue uh, is that imperial legacies do matter as to why it's difficult to put communities together. The neighborhood effect is actually a prologue <laughs> of another book uh, that I did several years ago. I did a book talk here called Russia Abroad, Driving Regional Fracture in Eurasia. So it was very much focused on Russia. Uh, but as a contemporary Russia, but as I was studying this phenomenon, how Russia essentially fractures region in its peripheries in order to control the uh, uh, to control those areas to project power globally, I started asking number one whether Russia is the only actor doing it, and whether this is a new strategy. As I started writing and thinking about this, I realized this actually goes much much deeper. This has imperial legacies. I'm a quality researcher and I'm not a historian, but I'm trained to follow the research questions <laughs> that come on my way. So I had to learn the method of historical analysis and I had to dive into historical analysis to understand what has been going on uh, in some of this area. So I do think that, I do argue in the book that imperial legacies matter. What you see, Russian invasion in Ukraine and the rhetoric that Putin uses and everybody's going crazy as to how this is, Putin is so imperial. But that actually does not even uh, touch the tip of the iceberg as to how the imperial fabric shapes this continent and makes it difficult to solve some of this conflict. Now, how do regions pacify? To essentially, these are a few charts that I wanted to show. This is from Uppsala Conflict Database, which shows uh, these are conflict formations, right? I, I, we don't have to zoom in. Um, the, the ones on this map that you probably, uh, I want you to pay attention is this red dot, I don't know, you can't see it there. Um, essentially, conflicts come in, it's kind of intuitive too, right? It's not, you don't have to be a um, highly trained political science to figure out that when conflict erupts in, in one region, it's probably going to spill over, or there are other underlying conditions for that to happen. So, um, here, regional forms of armed conflict, you see that Latin America, while it does have high level of armed criminal violence, it is literally virtually considered a zone of peace when it comes to ethnic conflict, armed conflict, political conflict. But you see that Sub-Saharan Africa remains a, a region that remains a, a, a engulfed in conflict formations. And of course, we see this is the region, 
uh, uh, that I'm, I spend more time today. Now, how do regions pacify and why care? Uh, the dominant scholarship in political science argues that, well, look, and I'm simplifying this a little, um, that look at European Union to pacify a region, you need strong states. Uh, there will be all kinds of interconnectedness between various governments and markets and tourists. Um, and then the regional structures will help to manage conflict. But basically, regional security is a top-down process. Um, and what I argue in this book is that uh, this narrative is very Eurocentric. Uh, assuming that you need a strong state to have a strong region, this is a much bigger story, which I try to uh, explore in this book, which is that to have strong states, you need to understand, you need to have stronger regions predating this. Meaning, it's the strong regions, connected regions, that create the conditions within which strong statehood is possible. Well, then the question becomes, where do these strong regions come from? And to understand that, uh, what I've done, I looked at the pre-World War II period, um, uh, some of these regions that are conflict regions, and I will not be talking about all of the uh, cases here, uh, whether it's the South Caucasus, where uh, this ethnic cleansing is happening right now, you have Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia, these countries, there were the part of Russian periphery, there were the Transcaucasian province in the Russian Empire, so that's one conflict formation there. Um, the, I, uh, another one is the western frontiers of the Russian Empire, where the Ukraine conflict is happening. The Bosnian conflict that was devastating, right? It settled down. I'm not sure if that's the right word, simply that there's no deep interconnection right now, but still that conflict can be considered um, resolved, um, albeit reconciliation is difficult. But Bosnia was part of the Habsburg Empire before World War I. Uh, and then the Kurdish conflict in Turkey, in Eastern Anatolia. So I will not be talking about all of this. I'll try to, um, working very hard, in not to be verbose, <laughs> in showing you that the way, the pattern in which some of these peripheries and empires were connected actually shaped the contemporary conflict formations because with the collapse of the Cold of Soviet Union and of the Cold War, some, for some reason, the Baltics did not engulf into war. The Poles and Ukrainians did not find themselves in conflict, right? So understanding not only as to why conflict happens, why does conflict break out, but also how does peace break out um, is really important. And we know more, actually, about why conflict happens than how does peace break out, right? And I'm teaching a peace and conflict studies class right now, and I'm loving it. It's my favorite course. I, I hate to admit it that I have a favorite course, but I do. Um, and in that course, we're actually trying to understand why is it that we don't understand how uh, the conditions of peace, what types of peace we tend to think as non-war. <laughs> but we're what we're realizing is that there are type, different types of non-wars. There are different types of non-fighting, and some of which can be more dangerous than others. So the... The, the, actually, forget, don't look at this text. I tell my students when you put slides together, minimal text, bullet points, get your argument. It's more, more like a cheat, a cheat sheet for myself than a slide for you. But um, w the way I define the concept, the neighborhood effect, um, as I was working on the book, I asked my then eight-year-old, so Helen, how would, what do you think neighborhood is, neighborhood effect is? And she had it just very intuitive for kids sometimes. It's when you're nice to your neighbor, and your neighbor is nice to their neighbor, and then it gets to your community, and then the, the, the city, and then the whole world, right? Uh, that essentially is a deceptively simple way of explaining it. In domestic po politics in the United States, obviously all kinds of factors are dependent on one another or at the regional level. But in turn, when it comes to world politics, our policies are not designed to build a region. Our policies very often, and not just Russia, United States policies also, um, by default or by design, tend to produce regional fact fracture, uh, in, particularly in the Eurasian continent, while this state's trying to build democracy, trying to build prosperity, trying to build the statehood, right? 
So the neighborhood effect is the organizing concept of the book. What it argues is that um, within, it, is a, it refers to um, geographically contiguous entities. Uh, this could be contemporary states, or could be ethno-religious communities in imperial peripheries. So it's a geographic concept. But it is designed to explain as to how these units relate to one another. And it is developed to understand the regional fabric in some of the spaces over a particular geography. Within imperial peripheries, and um, sometimes some of this connectivity, some of the peripheries, for example, the Habsburg Empire, which was considered the gentle empire, right? Um, it did have representative institutions that have been growing for since um, actually 19th, uh, 18th century. Um, uh, parliamentary institutions, civic groups were vibrant and thriving. Um, so there's a lot of civic depth in some of these imperial peripheries. But what I do in the book is to say all empires in general, be careful, exploitative, <laughs> unpredictable, not particularly developmental. I don't have to make a case as to how uh, devastating the imperial impact has been on developing countries. But what I try to do is to see, um, did the empires differ in how they organized political activity? What was political society in imperial peripheries? Because these empires were this gigantic, this very big animals. They were often myopic, they were often very crude. Sometimes they would use violence to control, but they always would try to centralize power, right? To reform and moderate. And whenever tried to do that over multi-ethnic, polity problems did start. So, but the, what the book shows, relying very much on existing secondary material historiography, is that peripheries varied actually. The single empire, Russian empire, and the current government, uh, Putin likes to um, deliver historical speeches. I don't think he knows Russian history very well, because if he did, he would have said that some parts, some of the legacies in the Russian empire actually are different. There had a Russian empire tolerated uh, more administrative structures, more representation in its western frontier than it did in the Transcaucasia, for example, where it ruled directly, right? So Russian empire basically created different legacies for democratization, not very good for Central Asia, so-so for South Caucasus, but actually positioned the western frontier pretty well. Um, Ottoman Empire, and I will not be talking, spending too much time on it, the Anatolia region. I call this the violent vortex. This is where the Armenian genocide took place, right, in 1915. I set up this book not to write about the genocide, but what occurred to me, essentially, um, the, the theory of regional fracture helped to explain as to why uh, the genocide became possible um, and why this periphery was so violent, how violence was used as a as a strategy. Now, whether such connectivity, civic ties, is bonding or bridging also matters. And this is not my scholarship. I'm relying heavily on existing political scholarship um, who have shown that communities, I, I see Rob sitting here who is very familiar with the social capital literature, right? that to have any democracy, good governance, human rights protected, you want tight communities, like this one. You come together, try to think about a problem, right? Um, sometimes these communities, regardless whether they're organized around an ethnic group um, or any other, uh, usually around when they're organized around the ethnicity, they can be very well developed, they can be organizationally developed, they can be a lot of organizations within the same ethnic group, um, but, which is bonding, right? It's good, it's still connectivity, it's still social capital, it's still good. But if you have a periphery or a contemporary region where you have bridging social capital, when you have connectivity, civic groups, communities across ethnic groups, that's where you have a political society that, that is on a strong footing. So um, 
the resi within resilient communities, what I found, you do have not only high level of civic activity, civic connectivity, but also a a a a bridging connectivity across ethnic lines. But there's one more important <laughs> dimension that you need to have to have this magic, desirable uh, resiliency. It's institutionalized cooperation. And I don't want to use the word democracy, but basically, basically if you have some sort of a parliamentary a representation, some sort of a space where the civic groups can come and bargain and talk, right? That's where social capital, the civic connectivity starts to deliver, starts to pacify a community. So this is why I think the fall of Nagorno-Karabakh today, the, the, uh, the ethnic cleansing that is happening, this exodus of people coming out, this essentially puts an end on Nagorno-Karabakh as an administrative unit. Um, this was a de facto state, it was an administrative unit during Soviet period, um, and it was always had a over century long, if not more, tradition of self-governance. So that coherence, that organization is being wiped out. And coming out of this research, learning of the value <laughs> of existing communities, organizations, institutions for conflict management, today it feels like history is moving backwards for me. So I'm a little, very, not a little, very, very disoriented. So, um, so then neighborhood effect as, a, as an approach helps to explain, essentially say that there's variance in how political society was organized in these peripheries. And the second takeaway from this book, it's a conflict theory. So after providing a description, there are three empirical chapters on some of these peripheries in the Ottoman Empire, Habsburg Empire, and the Russian Empire, right? Um, but when the sort of what I'm going after is, and this is not a causal claim, trying to see whether more resilient peripheries over 100 years ago did better in managing armed conflict when the Soviet Union collapsed when the Cold War ended, when the big thaws started, right? And this is where it's fascinating. Normally, when you look at all these conflicts, right, they're described as post-Soviet wars. And it is not correct, these are not post-Soviet wars. Whether it's the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, whether it's the Abkhazia conflict in Georgia, South Ossetia conflict in Georgia, um, whether, with an, actually, with an exception of the Ukraine, all of these conflicts, are based on pre-Soviet imperial, um, imperial uh, rivalries. And this conflict simply was baked into the Soviet system. So when the Soviet system did collapse, the rivalries, this conflict really emerged very quickly, which also indicates that Soviet system as a federative unit, and I'm not a specialist, by the way. I'm originally from Soviet Union. I was born and raised in Soviet Union, but I'm not a uh, historian or uh, uh, a historian of that period, of Soviet uh, uh, Union, I want to preface it. But because of the Soviet collapse, all these conflicts emerged, that really indicates that as an integrative unit, Soviet Union did not, was lacking in terms of building the type of deep connectivity that it set, the brotherhood, right, that it was building, the friendship between nations, right, that's, that's how we grew up just hearing it, right. Uh, but next door Georgia, growing up in Armenia, next door Georgia seemed very far to me. Moscow, which is much, much far from Yerevan, the capital of Armenia, felt much closer to me. It was an imperial system, <laughs> to put it simply. And what I do in the neighborhood effect, trying to see, uh, essentially skipping over that period, trying to see whether there is some sort of a correlation as to how some of these peripherals, how they were organized and how they fared after the end of the Cold War. Um, we don't have to look at this. I'm going to really go uh, uh, quickly so we can um, uh, simply talk about the policy implications. What does this work mean for contemporary insecurities in this region? Um, simply to say that on a uh, vertical, you see the density of social ties, how many civic groups, how many newspapers, um, how many women's groups, how many political parties, and vertically, whether those connections were balanced or clustered, were they spread out, were they bridging, 
or they were kind of organized around confessional or ethnic um, clusters. And the, all of the cases are organized on this chart uh, accordingly. Um, now, this is actually a quote from, uh, that really captures the social uh, capital notion from contemporary um, a writer, for actually uh, Ashdush Varshi, who is a political scientist at Brown University who studies India, Ethnic Conflict and Civic Life is the book that he wrote, where he argued that it's a bridging civic ties between Hindus and Muslims were more effective to avoid communal clashes even as they were triggered and pushed from the political center using networks of politicians and criminals that have been pu pushing such violence. And he also highlighted that, which also is su supported in my work as well, that the formalized institutionalized associations were needed to withstand these clashes. Meaning you can't rely on traditional institutions, your neighborhood community, right? That's not enough. That's good to have that social capital, but you need some institutionalization, some political space where these bargains can be made. And this is a quote from, I actually, this book was very much inspired by this article that I used in my teaching. It's, the article is called The Peace from the Past, Pre-Colonial uh, Political Institutions and Civil War in Africa. What this quote is saying is that before colonization started in Africa, there are various tribes in this continent. Some were centralized, some not so much, but those so colonizers come in, they leave, it's like I'm summarizing like several centuries of history here, but what he found using very detailed archival research, uh, using different types of maps, very, very rigorous, a quantitative study, is that those places where there were centralized institutions, tribal structures, they actually survived the uh, our conflict uh, after the colonizers left. And the reason as to why that is the case is that when you have centralized institution, pre-colonial, it is easier to bargain, to credibly bargain in conflict situations. Which again, is another reason as to why the ethnic cleansing that is horrendous that is happening now, but I think less appreciated is the fact that essentially the history is moving backwards in this part of the world, that you just got rid of a very a uh, well-developed administrative unit that had a president, that had parliaments, that had elections. People are used to elections. It was a raucous political system. And President Biden wants to promote democracy, uh, worries about the global decline <laughs> of democracy. Uh, but when it comes to minorities that are not organized, that self-organized, right, for security, as long as they are, um, they do not have a state, State sovereignty trumps those political democratic uh, in the democratic organizing, right? Because state sovereignty, um, the tyranny of state sovereignty gives this leaders like Azerbaijan's Aliyev to bulldoze through, do what he did, uh, right? As long as you don't kill a high number of people, you'll be okay, right? Especially if you have oil, that always helps. Now, in terms of on a lighter note, so when I was doing research, the reason that the Belgian chocolate has traditionally, historically been so good is because there were guilds of chocolate makers uh, that existed in Belgium until the end of 18th century, where professional associations of craftsmen and manufacturers, they were disciplined their members to maintain the standards set by the guild. I just thought to um, throw it here to simply to say strong social capital is good for democracy, it also makes um, good chocolate and a peaceful world. <laughs> now, in terms of um, defining, let me see how much time I have. Oh, it's four o'clock already. Let me sum up so we can talk about what this means um, in a contemporary world. Um, I think I, the, the book, is, again, looks at three empires, but here what you have is the super quick Habsburg Empire in the Bosnian province. The Balkan Wars of 1990s were bloody. I did my field work there after the Dayton Accords, and people were still traumatized. The first time I was there was 2002, and you could palpably see there was an explosion in an apartment where I was saying just it was a simple gas leak, right? That led to the building to go up in flames, and people were simply crying, looking at the fire, even though nobody was hurt. It was a pure construction. I never forget that sight. So this was a very bloody war, over 100,000 people that have died. 
the siege of Sarajevo, Srebrenica massacre, horrendous things. But what is interesting, well, Bosnian province was part of Habsburg Empire, the Gentile Empire, what happened? In terms of while in much of the Habsburg Empire, there was this deep civic connectivity, there was parliamentary, uh, the parliamentary institutions were there, constitutions was uh, acted, Bosnian province was treated differently. Bosnian province was treated as an attempt to modernize, right? To educate, and this was inter-ethnic. This used to be part of the Ottoman, Ottoman Empire, um, but they, uh, by the time a constitution was introduced in Bosnia, it was only a few years before World War I uh, broke out. So this is the reason as to why this very deeply, deeply fractured province, essentially, I argue in this book, there are numerous theories as to why the Balkan Wars have taken place, a variety of theories. This is just one explanation um, that I presented here. Um, in terms of the Russian Empire, I'm going very fast. People refer to Russia as the Russian bear. But I do think it's, we have to start using the Russian octopus. I think the fact that it is so vast geographically is conspicuous and it's important. It is politically hugely consequential. Why? Because the by Russian empire has been using territorial expansion to avoid institutional reform at home. It was easier to spread, provide security, rather than, which is a trend that is happening until now. Uh, another challenge of the Russian Empire, also faced by probably most empires, but Ottoman Empire also struggled with this big time, the, uh, the attempt to centralize and modernize the empire at the end of the 18th and early 20th century without participation. Russians delayed uh, administrative reforms created Zemstva, these participatory institutions in core Russian states, but they denied them to the Transcaucasia, contemporary South Caucasus, to Central Asia, where they directly, actually um, run uh, directly. Um, what is interesting, I'm going, skipping over Ukraine, and I'm going to spend some time on Transcaucasia, and I'll stop here, um, looking at the state of politics in South Caucasus, this period um, is fascinating, why? Transcaucasian province within Russian Empire, on the one hand, there is communal violence, simply because there is no, uh, the, the, there are no administrative structures, there are no representative institutions, but people were mobilized. There were political parties, and they're not all of them were nationalist parties. Uh, some were socialist parties, there were Marxists, there were Mensheviks, they were nationalists, there were really, really rich variety of parties in this region. What is also interesting here is that this entity, within Transcaucasia, the economic divisions, essentially, if I were to simplify, I would say the way British ruled in Africa, where ethnic um, ties overlapped with socioeconomic status, played out here as well. And it's this rivalry, the tension between Armenians and Azerbaijanis actually is baked into the Soviet system even then. Um, the book relying on really good historiography. Um, so the Baku, that was the oil capital, the world's oil capital then, um, had, it was very multi-ethnic. Uh, the oil sector was dominated. Armenians actually had about 30% of the population. Um, but the uh, uh, Azerbaijanis were actually mostly in the low-skill labor. Georgian society was largely nobility, so I mean it's a more middle class, but it really built this tension across ethnic lines, and the Soviet system did not do much in improving that. There was not a whole lot happening on that regard. So this is also a fractured region, even though a little bit differently, but it did not have representative institution, and this is on the one hand, there's great hybrid, there were communal clashes then, but there's also shocking level of progressive <laughs> regional diplomacy happening. Um, this cross-ethnic Armenians, Azerbaijanis, which then were referred to as Muslim Turks or Tatars, and Georgians, they would work together. They would uh, solve conflicts together. There were communal clashes, but they would get together. Tbilisi was the regional center, administrative center. Baku was the industrial center capital. And very short-lived organization, I'll stop here. I'm actually doing some more research on this. Transcaucasian Democratic Federative Republic. 
as the Russian Empire was collapsing, there's the socialist Bolsheviks took over, there was about a year when there was a chance for the Russian Empire uh, to be reformed, right? So everyone was actually hoping for it. So the Bolsheviks did not have much power in Transcaucasia. In its place, you had all of these political parties, Azerbaijanis, Georgians, Armenians are flourishing, they're forming groups, and then they did form this short-lived uh, federative republic. This is, by current standard, this is like insanely progressive. And I'm not afraid to use that word. This was short-lived. Contemporary Armenian, Georgian, Azerbaijani political elite, they don't talk about this because this federative republic collapsed and then for about three years, they, uh, two years, each one had independent republics before Bolsheviks came over and took over, right? But now the history is taught as history of independent states and nationalism, but what we need to be asking is, well, where did they come from? Where did these groups come from, right? And this uh, experiment, this very short-lived experiment, Transcaucasian Democratic Fed Federative Re Republic was an example of regional diplomacy. Short-lived, but pretty institutionalized. When you read this narrative as to how they organized elections, how they were represented, how agendas were formed, the three republics currently do not come close to having the level of regional diplomacy that existed there. So, I'll conclude with um, policy recommendations. Connectivity matters. Civic peace is obviously important, but that local actors have agency. Uh, the field of political science is so dominated by geopolitical theories. I mean, you look at the Nagorno, much of the analysis that is happening on Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, that's the way it happened, about 80, 90% of it is interest of Russia, interest of Turkey, interest of the European Union, right? What I argue in this research, actually local agency matters, right? The nature of connectivity matters. Um, and uh, underutilized regional statecraft is really um, one policy takeaway that I would like to leave you with. And the West, industrialized West, um, this is going to sound too harsh, uh, but that's what I found. They haven't figured out a way to utilize, to build regional conditions for democracies to thrive. On the words, sitting here, we could uh, lecture you on the politics in the Middle East, watching as to how the West has empowered autocrats there, oil for oil stability, and making it very difficult for democracy to break out, for states to become strong. That same, uh, that template has not changed much. There is no advocacy happening for building a region than letting the states do the democracy building on their own. Whenever, and there's lots of political scholarship, if you provide regional stability, that's when states democratize. So I'll stop here, and if you have questions, um, maybe I'll take some questions. Thanks for uh, putting up with me, by the way. There was a lot of... <laughs> Hi, I actually have two questions. One might show my ignorance, and I apologize. I hear, Bajan, is that cut in in two sections by um, Armenia. What the, in the lower left is another Azerbaijan. And I saw the article this morning, and I actually tried to do a quick Wikipedia to figure out what was going on with Azer Azerbaijan, yeah. whether I'm there are, to get to the are yeah. yeah. So in the lower left is where the Nakhchivan. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that the same country? Is what I was trying yeah. to figure out. So this is pure and simple gerrymandering that Joseph Stalin has done. When they were trying to grapple with this nationality, on the one hand, they're trying to bring all these different ethnic groups while also building this social into the socialist camp. So they're trying to get as many nationalities as they can. So there's a lot of divide and conquer happening. So this Transcaucasia communities were dispersed, intermingled. Um, Georgians and Azerbaijani were most uh, concentrated. The Armenians were more spread out. But what he did, this is Armenia. Majority Armenian Nagorno-Karabakh, which uh, Nagorno-Karabakh Republic, it looked like he was going to give to give, is the right word, to give to Armenia. He did not. At the last minute, change of a, a pen, with the stroke of a pen, he left this as part of Azerbaijan as an autonomous region, autonomous region, and then gave this Nakhichevan, which was also mixed. I think there were 
70% Armenians here now, with the collapse of the Soviet Union during Soviet years, all were gone. Cemeteries removed, etc. No, no, nothing. But this is Azerbaijan. So yes, you're right. It was split. This is an exclave, and this is Turkey. Now, while we're talking about the exodus, the ethnic cleansing that is happening as we speak, there is continued threat by Azerbaijan and Turkey to bisect Armenia, to cut through Armenia, what the President Aliyev calls a corridor. It wants a corridor. China is connecting from East Asia to Europe, does not need a corridor. President Aliyev needs a corridor. What he means by corridor is extraterritorial transit. This is insane. Meaning that I need to be able to cut through here and get to Turkey because I want to be part of the Turkey world, but I don't want you to have checkpoints here. I don't want to tell you what I'm transporting, right? You have no control over it, which essentially is a hybrid war strategy that down the road, they will simply use that road as a way to slice off this part and create a wedge, because he's, he's referring to this as Western Azerbaijan. So now, American diplomacy has been very focused in saying that territorial integrity matters, border stability matters, meaning the same way that we were not as strict when you essentially got rid of this entity because it's your state, territorial sovereignty, integrity, the same principle now applies here. But what is fascinating about this continent, Eurasian continent, this is a post this is a new imperial continent. On the one hand, we talk about we talk about rules, liberal rules-based world order. You recognize borders, state sovereignty, self-governance, norms against conquest. International law does not recognize taking over territories by force, and that's the great news in international politics, right? The world has pacified because that norm has been so strong. Um, but what Turkey, increasingly authoritarian, Iran, and Russia are increasingly playing new imperial logic, meaning borders fuzzy, limited military operations here and there, okay, as long as you don't announce that you just took over a territory, Turkish troops in Syria, right? Um, so all of this makes the border stability difficult. So it's actually, we'll see whether the United States and the West will succeed in maintaining border stability uh, in this region. And why is Azerbaijan using violence? Because number one, he then sends a message to his society. So violence is a strategy. Violence is the strategy. Because there's peace for, he already had this. There's a 2020 agreement that stopped the 44-day war. So it's a matter of time until he would get full, full control over this entity. No, he used violence, bulldozed through the peace process. And this way, he sends a signal to his domestic uh, to, to his people inside. Now, the Azerbaijan society is going to be way more uh, authoritarian than before. It's already pretty low. Uh, but it also creates the type of, and he has been kind of coordinating with uh, Russia as well. It supports this fuzzy logic, new imperial logic. You see the border, you don't see the border. Maybe we'll protect your sovereignty, maybe not. Maybe today I'm not going to demand a corridor, maybe tomorrow I will. And that is very beneficial to Turkey, Russia, and Azerbaijan. So if you don't have regional stability, there's no way Azerbaijani society will democratize. That's what he wants. Actually, he's a pretty, he probably, I don't know if he's reading Poland, I don't think he's reading political science research, but intuitively he knows. If this region pacifies, because Armenia promised, they said, look, borders, let's open the borders any way you want to, anything, op open borders, the same way you have borders with Georgia and Iran. But no, he wants a corridor because that's difficult. He can use it as a way to expand. And he needs a conflict because the minute this region stabilizes, he's going to have to face domestic questions, domestic pressure, because the oil is running out, gas is not, cannot take over, the world is moving towards green transition, so in that respect, if you look from the climate change, this types of conflicts probably don't be surprised. Societies that do have, uh, Central Asia is gonna be stable, or authoritarian, but they're heavy in, uh, they have a lot of oil. Kazakhstan is rich in oil, right? Azerbaijan is not. So as an actor, Azerbaijan behaves differently. It's more likely to start a war than Kazakhstan, right? 
So these institutional factors do matter as to how states behave regionally. This is a very long answer to a very simple question. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hey, I'm sorry we were late, so I hit a lot of these questions. But uh, one question is, and I was curious, what were the factors in, in the dismantling of the federation that you mentioned? Ah. Uh, and the second one that just came up as you were speaking was of when the first Nagorno-Karabakh war happened. Was that also a partly a result of this? Both in Armenia and in Yeah. So the, that trans, the Trans-Caucasian Democratic Feder, Federative Republic lasted only from, from February till May. Uh, it was part of the reason is that geopolitical tensions did spill over. Uh, perhaps because if the region had prior experience, if there were Russia had created, had allowed some parliamentary systems to function, it would have it would have survived. But uh, Georgia, uh, uh, the Azerbaijanis were very much still playing the wanted Turkey, essentially following what Turkey wanted. Uh, Georgians were looking at Germany, right? So they started thinking about uh, world uh, about independent having independent countries and Armenian Ar Armenians were very very afraid of, of the Ottoman Empire then because they just had recovered barely from the Ottoman from the genocide so this geopolitical this is the argument the geopolitical they could not manage this geopolitical rivalries and once the republics uh, the, the three republics were created um, they were very weak in terms of capacity I was just in Georgia this past summer doing some research in the uh, current Democrat, democracy activists I interviewed, there were just, there were very, things are not going well in Georgia. It's declined, democracy is in decline. They were just surprised as to how much the two year period that democratic government has done in terms of reforms. In terms of the first Karabakh war, that's a very good question. Basically, when Soviet Union was collapsing, was disintegrating, Gorbachev comes in and announces this perestroika and restructuring, in that period, Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh were the first one. They started, uh, they applied to uh, Moscow. They wanted to be joined with Armenia, to which uh, Gorbachev said no. That would be bad for the friendship of nations. Um, so essentially, they did a referendum. A few weeks before the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, once they did the referendum, the attack started from Azerbaijan. There are pogroms in Baku. There are Armenians, a lot of Armenians that lived in Baku, Sumgait. So pogroms started, Arme there were Azeris, Azerbaijanis who were living in Armenia, they, start, they started moving because they did not feel safe because the conflict was building. And essentially, my, when people now are analyzing, their, analyzing this conflict, they say, oh, it's the mirror image, it's not the mirror image. Then, these countries were weak, they were born into this conflict, they had no capacity in managing this conflict. And what you see now, these countries are 30 years old, there are peace processes, uh, that have been ongoing, bulldozing through a peace process has triggered the humanitarian crisis. That's what's so different about this. And my worry is that this is a part of a trend. Um, we had 2009, Sri Lankan government by force bulldozed through a peace process and quote unquote took care of the tunnel conflict there. So the data on armed conflict shows when the Soviet Union collapsed, the number of armed conflicts in the world has increased, but so did the number of negotiated settlements, conflicts ending with negotiated settlements. Since the war in Syria, again, we're seeing an increase in armed conflicts, but we're not seeing corresponding increase in negotiated settlements, meaning that we are living at a time <laughs> that when we say, oh, the world is multipolar, this is how the liberal components of the world order are weakening because the conflicts are not resolved peacefully and violence is validated. So, so that's how I'm looking at this uh, region, which can tell you a lot. It actually can tell you the temperature uh, of, the, uh, of the world right now. Not just this region, a few more other regions. Yes. Got a couple of questions. Uh, before I retired as a high school teacher, I had a 
um, a student from Bosnia as an exchange student. And so we talked a lot, because he was very articulate, but he never really identified as a Bosnian because he always claimed he was, he was a Serb. Yeah. And we haven't heard much about conflict in Bosnia recently. Are institutions growing there that will lead to stability, or is it something that's going to erupt from the least expected? It has been, um, so since the, the way the Dayton Accords were uh, negotiated, the Bosnia basically has um, Federal Bosnian Federation is one entity, and then Republic of Serbska is another entity. Uh, that is, Sarajevo used to be called the Jerusalem of Eastern Europe, but after the war, it is heavily segregated. When I was doing field work there, if there was a job in Sarajevo for a Serb, that Serb would not move to Sarajevo from, from Republic of Srpska to take that job. Um, there are three presidencies. Essentially, the current constitutional system is very cumbersome, largely, and the criticism that the Dayton Accord faces is that it legitimized this marriage of ethnicity and political processes and made it difficult to forge a civic citizenship of a Bosnian state. Uh, so right now, things are stable. It is on track to of trying to get into EU, but the reforms are not going well. The president of Republika Srpska, the eastern part, is heavily calling for separation. And our friend Putin is supporting that process quite extensively. Corruption remains an issue. So the international institutions are still there in managing the country. You still have Europeans, are uh, intertransitional administrative structures there. So it's still, it's stable, but the level of poverty is high, out migration is high. Um, it's a difficult process. I don't, uh, I don't know whether it will erupt or not. Uh, there's heavy international presence, um, but it just, again, looking at armed conflict data, there is a debate whether conflicts are better solved by so whether separatism is a better idea or trying to integrate. Most conflicts are solved by integrating autonomy, federalism, democratization overall. That's the move. That's how conflicts have been managed. Um, but I, I can't tell you whether it's likely to erupt or not. I don't think it will. Um, but at the same time, I think that European integration as an incentive to democratize, you see that strategy happening in Georgia as well. That tends to polarize, introduces geopolitics into domestic politics, and makes it difficult to consolidate democracy. So, so let's hope. <laughs> let's hope that things move in the right direction. Just on that hopeful note, Professor, yeah. please feel welcome to stay as long as you can hold on to the professor. It's, it's up to you. Um, but just in the interests of uh, the movement of the library, I just can I just make a few things? Sure, absolutely. The, the, the important part that I forgot is that the Armenian Research Institute, you know how Stanford University is, nothing is less than three figures, but they managed to get us a wonderful discount of uh, $50. So if you're interested in getting uh, a copy of the book today for $50, Adam is there to help you out. That's one big thing. And Father Kevin, is right here. I want to thank him because without him, this, this whole scholarly series that has been resurrected at the Stonehill College would not have happened. Uh, the idea is really to spotlight our faculty as you, as you just saw. So please keep this in mind. We're trying for the last Thursday of every month. And the next one is October 26th, the last Thursday. And get ready for Heidegger. Rich, uh, Professor Richard Capobianco will be here. So please put that on your calendar. Um, this is not scholarly, but this is a lot of fun. How many of you know that the eclipse is coming on Saturday, October 14th? The annular. And we've got a little grant that gives you sunoculars, free sunoculars. So try and put that on your calendar because we've got our uh, faculty in the physics and astronomy department, Professor Alessandro Maserati and Professor Francesca Pornacini, who will be coming here to talk about the scientific aspects of an eclipse then you can leave with one of those binoculars. <laughs> so please, right now, thank you so much. That's on Saturday, the, the uh, 
Eclipse is Saturday, October 14th. The talk is on Friday, October 13th. Friday the 13th. What's more perfect than a mysterious occurrence? And it's at 12.45. So, so, so great. So as I said, please stay on and talk to the professor. But those of you who want books, oh, but you have to sign them as well. I'm happy to. <laughs> yeah. I have a horrible handwriting. I, I'm not sure if you want your books signed by me. Every great person has a horrible signature, yeah. so that can be a good company. But uh, perhaps yeah, you can talk <laughs> as you're signing, and you're welcome to get these, these books as well. Yes? Thank you very much. Actually, I did have a question about the whole connectivity part of it. You know, you've established it as something that leads to uh, physical pockets. Now, is there a template? I think it since we did. Attempted to try and encourage these connected. Yeah. 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 Yeah.